This introductory video uh, addresses the first law of thermodynamics and in particular how uh, we can turn that into a rate equation that we can use uh, in heat transfer problems. So the first law of thermodynamics is a statement of the conservation of energy, one of those fundamental principles of the universe. And uh, that uh, conservation of energy says basically that you can't create energy or destroy energy so if we define a system, um, the change in energy of that system is going to be whatever goes into that system minus whatever comes out of it. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> this guy uh, is creating some energy. He's non-physical. Uh, so the units of this are in the units of energy in joules. Uh, but in heat transfer, generally, we want to talk about rate equations. We're going to talk about how things change with time. So we want to change the first law into a rate equation. And we do that with little dots. Uh, put a little dot above all these. And those dots indicate a derivative with respect to time. So you can imagine that all of these are going to be d, dt terms. Uh, so we can look at the change of energy of what's coming in. Uh, and what's going out, and that's going to give us the instantaneous um, rate of change of the energy in, um, uh, in that system. So each dotted term represents a rate of change over time. So that's telling us how much energy per unit time is coming into the system, how much energy per unit time is going out, and then this term is uh, the energy of this, the change in the energy of the system uh, per unit time. And the units here are no longer in energy. They're not in joules, but they're in watts, uh, joules per second. So all we've done is taken the first law of thermodynamics, one of those key principles, and turned it into a rate equation that tells us how things are changing over time, which is the fundamental concern of heat transfer. All right, in order to use the first law, we have to think about what a system is and how we define that. So we de define a boundary, and then we call whatever is inside that boundary a system. Now that can be anything, anything that has some kind of mass or volume um, that, uh, that we can talk about as a separated space. Um, it's gonna change how we think about a problem based on how we set up that boundary. So we want to be careful how to do that to try and make sure that we can determine when something is crossing a boundary or not. Uh, and once we successfully do that, we call this a control volume. Uh, so we're kind of thinking about everything in this system is inside, everything else is outside. And we can make that volume whatever size or shape we want, and we usually want to do it in a way that makes it convenient for us uh, to solve the problem. One special case uh, is when we create a really narrow control volume called a control surface and we make that infinitesimally small uh, and the reason we do that is as we shrink it down and down into an infinitesimal surface it doesn't have any volume uh, and so if it doesn't have any volume or if it has infinitesimal volume uh, the amount of energy that it has is going to be very very small uh, and so we can basically treat that as whatever goes in has to come out. Um, and so here's, you know, if we had a problem with a solid, with a fluid interface, anything that went through the solid as conduction, any thermal energy that went through the solid would have to leave that surface uh, through convection or radiation or uh, whatever process. Whatever flows must flow out. Now, that equation that we were just looking at is a fairly all-inclusive. The first law is, you know, it looks simple, but it's, uh, there's a lot going on when you talk about total energy, this term up here. Um, and we're going to try and simplify that equation in order to solve some problems. So one of those things that we're going to do is we're going to say, oh, really, we're just interested in thermal and mechanical energy. So here we have kinetic energy and potential energy as mechanical energy, and then sensible and latent energy as uh, our thermal energies. And if we just have those types of energies, 
In other words, we don't, we're not concerned with electrical energy, wave energies, uh, chemical energies, nuclear energies. We're sort of putting all of these in a category over here. Then we can change the equation so that it matches this. And you'll notice we don't, we don't have the total up here as a subscript anymore. This is just mechanical and thermal energy. Uh, and then we have an E in and an E out and an E gen term, and that is generated energy. So if say we have some uh, wire with a resistance that's producing some thermal energy, we just call that generated energy or a, a, a you know, radioactive material that's giving off thermal energy over time. We just call that generated energy and that simplifies our calculations. Another way that we simplify the first law is to close our system, to say that there's no mass uh, crossing those boundaries. Uh, and that makes things a lot easier because we don't have to deal with the uh, temperature and flow speed uh, uh, and the pressure of that fluid that might be entering our system. Uh, and this reduces our equation to this, where again, this is mechanical thermal energy over here. There's no little total subscript. Um, we have Q, thermal energy coming in or out. We have work, uh, if the system is doing work or having work done on it, uh, being compressed or expanding. Uh, and then we have an energy generation term. We can expand this a little bit just to remind ourselves that Q dot means, okay, we've got a Q coming in and potentially a Q going out. We've got work done on or by the system. Uh, and we want to remember that work done on or by the system is about expansion and, uh, and contraction and compression. So this is actually, we're not going to do a lot with work in this class. A lot of times we can get rid of that work term as well if we have a closed system, in which case then we're only dealing with um, Q in and Q out and E gen. One final uh, <laughs> simplification is this really long list of assumptions here. Closed MT system, no phase change, no boundary change, no flow, no change in potential or kinetic energy. Um, that seems a little uh, ridiculous uh, to have that many assumptions, but it actually describes a lot of systems that just have, if we're talking just about a solid or a static fluid uh, and it, uh, reduces that equation quite considerably uh, to this guy down here where the E dot of our system, the change in energy of the system is only about the temperature of the system. So this is our calorimetry equation um, that describes how energy is related to the change in temperature. So temperature becomes the only variable over here, presumably mass stays the same and our specific heat is gonna be mostly constant. Uh, and then that's going to be equal to whatever is flowing into or out of that system and whatever energy is being generated in that system. Now, you'll notice that we used a little Q here. Uh, and the reason I did that here is because that's what we'll use most of the time from here on out. That's the Q, the big Q dot is a thermo uh, lingo. Uh, the little Q is our heat transfer lingo. And so that's the, the rate of uh, heat transfer. Okay, so just a reminder, all of those equations that we've looked at are just simplifications of this fundamental first law of thermodynamics. Um, when we solve problems, we want to try and simplify that equation because we don't want to deal with all the different kinds of energies and all the different ways that mass and uh, and work can happen in a system. And so we try to simplify and we ask ourselves, can I get rid of non-mechanical thermal terms and just call that E gen? Most of the time we're gonna be able to do that. Um, in fact, I can't think of a problem that we don't, <laughs> we don't do that. Is it a closed system? Is there mass moving across this boundary? Uh, if not, it simplifies our lives. And then can I reduce the change in energy to a change in sensible heat? That's a question of phase, right? If we don't have any phase change here, um, then all of our change in energy is gonna be represented by a change in temperature, uh, and we can change that E dot term uh, to a DT, uh, DT, a change in temperature over time. 
Once we've simplified that, remember these are all going to be rate equations. That's what those little dots are. Then we can use the rate equations for convection, conduction, uh, and radiation to solve uh, for the flows into and out of a system. So that's where we'll turn next uh, in the first couple of days here is remembering what those rate equations are uh, back from our uh, intro physics classes. And now we get to <laughs> enough pictures of potatoes. Let's heat up some potatoes.